Hey everyone, welcome to Mosaic House Online Worship. Before we start, I just want to say I am glad you're here. I am thankful to the Lord Jesus that you are here. And yet, the Holy Spirit encourages me to encourage you to find a local church where you may serve the risen Christ and His bride, His body, the local church. As, as, as thankful we are, as grateful we are for the gift of online, that was just only a substitute. So it is in the will of the risen Christ that we engage in the body of Christ in person, using our time, talents, and treasure. So let's do that, all right? I want to tell you about my good friend. My good friend, not, not just good friend, better than a good friend. You know how you have friends like acquaintances, and within there you have friends that you really know and, and care about, and among that circle you have really good friends, right? Well, Rene is one of them, and I am sad to report to you that he has been diagnosed with a severe case of leukemia, and even more sadly, the chemo treatments did not work. His health deteriorated, and now he's been moved to a hospice care. And I've been thinking about our friends. What makes my friend such a good friend to me? What has he done for me in terms of becoming a better person or following Jesus with all my might and passion and zeal? What has he done? How has he expressed his love and loyalty to me? And how has he been so kind and gracious, not only to me, but to my family? I've been thinking about all this, you know? You know? And I began asking the question, what makes a friend a really good friend? A friend that you can count on, a friend that you desire that you had. You know what I'm talking about? Have you one? Maybe more than one? Two? Three? Blessed are you. So today we'll be talking about how to cultivate healthy friendships. Christ is risen, Easter Sunday, and we're in the church season called Eastertide in the Christian calendar. And Eastertide is about, hey, Christ is risen, therefore, how then should we live? How then shall we live? Since Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And one of the responses to the question is, the risen Christ wants you and me to cultivate healthy relationships, healthy marriages, healthy parent-children relationships, healthy relationships with our neighbors, colleagues, among friends. How should we celebrate singleness? How to communicate, you see? So on the first week in this series called Fragile, Handle with Care, because relationships, relationships can be very fragile, and the tagline is how to cultivate healthy relationships. This is in the will of the risen Christ. So the first week, we dealt with this. How it all starts with you. That's right. It starts with you. Probably the most important message of the whole entire series. How it starts with you. The second message was how to communicate in any relationship, whether between spouses, parents, children, any relationship among friends. Communication is hard, isn't it? My wife and I have been together married for the last 20, 20 years, and guess what? We are still working on our communication. Honey, did I hear you say, no, you did not? And last week, we talked about, we received the message on how to forgive, how to forgive any relationship. There are hurts, pains, and disappointments, and that's why we talked about this. And today, we'll be addressing, receiving the word from the Bible. How should we cultivate healthy friendships? So let's get to it, shall we? I'll be using, referring to various passages in the Bible from the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a unique book in that it was written by the King Solomon, the person who was the wisest of all. And he wrote this book, he addressed it to his son. It's like, it's like King Solomon saying to all of us, as if we were his sons and da daughters, saying, hey, children, listen to these proverbs. What's a proverb? Proverb is an advice, um, counsel, if you will, but 
Proverbs are wise wisdom sayings. So we're going to receive all these verses put together on the topic of friendship. Allow me to start with a prayer. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, our God and Lord, we worship the risen Christ, your Son. Lord Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of God because you are risen from the dead. And because you are risen, life has purpose and meaning and its fullness, fullness in you. So we come to you now, O Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that we may see, hear, feel Jesus, O Lord Jesus, lead us to you. Make us better friends to others. To your glory, in the name of Christ, amen. Would you write these words in your sermon outline for the theme and the goal of this sermon message? Open your life fully to the friends you can trust deeply. I got this line from a pastor in all the way in Great Britain by the name of Colin Smith. I thought it was really good, very poignant and profound, so I am borrowing it. Open yourselves, open your life fully to the friends you can trust deeply. And that's because when you find trust, uh, when you find friends who are trustworthy, when you find men and women, your friends, whom you can trust, then you can really open up. And then those two ingredients create, forge healthy friendships. So let me take you to the first point. There are three. First point is this. Then how should we go about discovering trust for friends? How should we go, go about opening ourselves to these trustworthy friends. Number one, are you ready? Write these words. Choose your friends wisely. Choose your friends wisely. Let's look at chapter verse, uh, chapter 18 of, of the book of Proverbs, verse 28. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What is the Holy Spirit saying in this proverb council? If you don't have reliable friends, your life will come to a wound. It's that serious. We need friends. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, the Creator God made your life and mine such that our life will come to a stretching halt. It will come to a ruin if you and I have, don't, have any, don't have any friends. Furthermore, look at this, the second part. There's a friend who, is, who sticks closer than a brother. This is a mind-boggling statement. A friend can stick, can become even better than your biological family, brother. The word to stick, it appears in Genesis. It also means to cleave. Remember that passage where God says, for this reason, a husband will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So that word, to stick, to cleave among two friends, two good trusting friends, that, that requires commitment, that requires a covenant, that requires such deepened relationship and trusting relationship that it's better among, between two friends than a brother. What's the difference between friends and family? Now, there are different kinds of loves, right? There's, there's, the, there's the familiar love, you know, family love, and then there's the agape love, love between God and us, and then, and then there is the brotherly love. Uh, so this is kind of like that, okay? That is to say, we are um, friends. Well, I, th I think this is the main difference. With family, you don't get to choose your family, do you? Did you get to choose your mom and dad? No, you didn't. And mom and dad, did, did, did you get to choose your son and daughter? Well, you had much to do with the procreation, but in terms of that particular creature, nope, you got what came out. You know what I mean? You don't get to choose your family. You love your family. You are loyal to your family, but you don't always like them, do you? I think some of my family members 
don't like me, they love me. <laughs> they're committed to me, they're loyal to me, but I'm not sure if they all like me. But friends, they're different. You choose your friends. Yes, you do. You get to select them. Not everyone becomes your family. Let's look at Proverbs 18. This is another reason for which you need to choose your friends wisely, therefore. Chapter 18, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. This is an amazing truth, something about which you have known already. Walk with the wise, and what happens? You become wise. You know that word walk? It means to have companionship with. Walk with the wise, you become wise. Walk with the fools, then you become a fool. And that's because our friends shape us. Or we shape our friends. And that's why it takes so much wisdom and counsel to choose wise friends. Let me take you to the let me take you to the ultimate verse. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Bad company corrupts good character. And there you have it. Bad company corrupts good character. And this is why it is so imperative you be really selective as to whom you choose as your friends because you become what your friends are or they become what you are. And this is what makes friendship really unique kind of relationship. You know, our modern world, when you watch movies and when you listen to songs, you, you know what they say? You know what you hear? You know what you see? I will tell you. Well, thanks for asking. I'll tell you. You see things, you hear things like, you choose to be whatever you want. That's not true. That's, that's a lie, friends. That is a lie. You do not choose. You can't choose who you become. And that's because when you are little, your family shaped who you are. It's the values and the habits and the lifestyles of your particular family that shaped you. But then after that, it's your friends that shape you. It's your friends that make you who you are today. Let me give you an illustration. When I came to the U.S. from South Korea, this was back in 1981, I was 14 years old, there were two older boys, okay, so they, both of them were, this, their, their, their names were Ike and Troy, four years older than I, I was in the junior high, they were in the high school, and both of them, Ike and Troy, came to the U.S. at about the same time, similar family lifestyle, Immigrant families, immigrant teenagers, right? Okay. Ike was a geek. All of, he, all of his friends were nerds and geeks. Nothing wrong with that. And as a result, guess what? He was really good in school. He was good in math and science. He did really well. Now, Troy, on the other hand, he was a jock. He was a soccer phenom at this high school. And he had long wavy hair, and, and all the girls had a thing for him. And he began hanging out with the jocks, the soccer players, all the popular people with, with the potheads. And he, he would go on weekends to these, these parties where parents went home, and he'd get drunk, he'd get drunk, you know, girls and pot. You get the idea. Fast forward. Ten years later, Ike the Geek who hung around with a bunch of geeks and nerds, he became a, a, a upper-level manager at the Ford Motors Company, making lots of money, married, four children. And what happened to Troy? He was working in a restaurant as a waiter. Had a girlfriend, two kids out of wedlock, still smoking pot. And I remember my father saying to me, son, look at Ike and Troy. What's the difference? What made the difference? Everything else seemed to be about the same. You know, lifestyle, family backgrounds, their age. One huge difference was the company they kept. 
The scripture is so right. Bad company corrupts, infests, destroys one's character. And that's why the first step is what? Choose your friends wisely. May I take you to the second point? But before I do that, I want to pose a question to you. Would you answer this question? It will be on the slide. Are you becoming what your friends are? Or are they becoming what you are? What do you think? Are you pulling them to your values and your habits and your lifestyle? And I'm praying these all oh, these are good and, and godly and Christ-like. Or are they pulling you to their values, to their lifestyle, and to their habits, which may not align with Christ Jesus, the risen Lord? How would you answer the question? Very important, very important. So let's move on. Again, the theme and the goal is open your life fully to the friends you can trust deeply. First step, choose friends wisely. Second step, this is really important. Forge your friends solidly. Once you choose them, you, you, you don't just let it go. It's not going to drive automatically. You have to forge this health. You have to forge. The picture that I have is a blacksmith. Big forearm, sweaty body with a big sledgehammer. And this iron that has been seared like heated, red, red, red hot. And he's forging that with this big hammer. Doom, doom. You like the sound effect? There we go. That's what it means. It takes effort. Forge, forge. Proverbs 25, verse 27. Let's read it together. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house. Too much of you, and they will hate you. And you go, huh? What's the Holy Spirit talking about? In a word, it's about self-aware. Are you, you are self-aware when you are self-aware as to what your flaws are, what you are like, what your strengths are? What, how you edify others and how you annoy others, when you are self-aware, that becomes the first step in which, with which you forge this relationship solidly, soundly. I don't have time to expound further on this, other than to say, would you please watch my first video, how it starts with you. In any relationship, the first step in health or cultivating health in the relationship among friends, between spouses, parent, child, you name it, it starts with you. The best gift you can give to others in your relationships is a healthy you. And one thing that makes you healthy is what? When you are self-aware. Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. My point exactly. You have to become self-aware. And when you don't know what you are, you don't, if you don't know how you edify others, how you annoy others, how you either build or tear, then you don't know how you're doing. So please go and watch that first message. Let me take you to Proverbs 25, verse 20. Would you read it with me? Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on a wound, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Let's read one more. Proverbs 27, 10. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Look at this. Here's the principle. When you find that friend whom you can trust, open up, then you've got to forge that friendship. Here's how you do it. You do life together. Write that word. You do life together, which is the slogan for our house church movement. Doing life together. How? On a cold day, we give our garment to our friend who's cold, you see. Okay? And we don't pour vinegar on a wound. No, we don't. And, and we don't sing songs of joy when our friends are down with a heavy heart. What do we do instead? When they rejoice, we rejoice. When your friends suffer, we suffer. That's the meaning of the word compassion. 
come together as in community, C-O-M, and passion, pate, which, which means to suffer. So compassion means to suffer together. We laugh together, we cry together. We meet the needs of one another. And because life, friendship is all about doing life together. That's how you forge a trustful friendship. It takes time. And that's why good friendships take seasons and years to mature and to bring into fruition. Proverbs 16, verse 28. A perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. What's the principle there? How do you forge healthy friendship? You honor their character. You protect the reputation of your friends. This happens all the time, doesn't it? It happens on Facebook, it happens on Instagram, it happens on social media, it happens among friends, it happens all the time. What's happening? Gasping! People talking about other people when it's not their business. And as a result, their character is defamed or slandered. You know, here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. When someone comes to you, and gossips about someone else, your friend. You know what you should do? Rather than just listening or even joining in the gossip, some of you do that. Stop it. Some of you, when you hear someone gossiping about your friend, you don't engage with them. You don't jump on the bandwagon, but you just remain silent. Stop that too. Here's what you and I should do. Here's what Christ is calling us to do. When someone gossips about your friend, you honor their character. You protect their reputation. You say, stop, stop. I don't know what happened between you and my friend, but I'm going to ask you to stop. Because that's my friend, and I'm going to honor their character. Again, I don't know what's happening. I'm not taking sides, but do not speak ill of my friend. I'm going to protect their rep rep reputation until... It is proven otherwise. You see, that's what we got to do. Wouldn't you want a friend like that? Wouldn't you want a loyal friend who will stick up and who will stand up for you? I know I would. Listen, here's why this is so important in terms of forging your friendship. If your friends gossip about other people to you, then they will gossip about you. Hmm. Can I get an amen? You've been there too. I mean, in the receiving end, not in the giving end. Proverbs 27. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Oh, I just love it. How do you forge healthy friendship? You tell your friends the truth, which may hurt. But here, look. If it's coming from a friend that you trust, you can take it because you trust them. And they are saying it to you for your own benefits. They, they're, they're taking this hard step and saying, Victor, I got to confront you, Victor. I got to tell you the truth about you. I know it's going to hurt. It may leave a wound. But you're going to receive that because you, your, you believe that your friend is on your side. He is for you. She is for you as opposed to an enemy who multiplies kisses, who, who just flatters you, says, says all the good things about you, and never tells the truth. That is no true friend. True friends, true friends, tell the truth. You know, that friend of mine, Rene, in the in introduction, one lesson he taught me was this. Victor, mean what you say, say, say what you mean, and never mean when you say it. I remember that proverb. I remember that counsel. Let me repeat that. Repeat after me. Say what you mean. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Mean what you say. And never be mean when you say it. Never be mean when you say it. It's truth telling. And that's how you begin to give and receive trust. Now, I can't do this right now. But at this point, I would love to invite Irina, a participant in my house church, and I want to share 
ask her to share with you, which I will do on Sunday in person. She's going to share with you what her house church meant for her in terms of discovering and forging this friendship, these friendships that, that add value and life into her life and to her faith. And that's why I, always, I say again, you've got to find a local church. Let me move on to the third point. What's the first point? Choose friends wisely so that you may open fully and to the friends that you can trust deeply. Second step, what is it? What's the second step? Come on now. Come on now. Forge friendships solidly. Third step is conform to your ultimate friend completely. Conform to your ultimate friend completely. Here's a quote from Tim Keller. Tim Keller was a, a pastor, church planter in Manhattan, New York. Here's what he said. The reason we don't have enough great friends is because we are not great friends. <laughs> oh, that just did a thing in my heart. Like, mm. See, Victor, there you go. What Jesus wants, the risen Christ desires in me and you, is that we become these trustful friends so that our friends can open up to us fully, thereby experiencing the joy and the gift of true friendship. But the reason we don't have great friends is we are not great friends. We're not being a good influence. Listen, listen. One of the most well-known verses in the book of Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's like the question, are you becoming what your friends are? Or are your friends becoming what you are? So the question is, who's going to sharpen me and you? Who is going to influence us about whom you and I are going to become like? Because that person is pulling. That person is attractive. And we want to follow that friend. Who is that ultimate friend? You guessed it. It's the risen Christ. I'm going to read John 15. This passage just blew me away. It just ruptured my, my, my mental capacities. How can this be possible? Let me take you. John 15, before Christ was betrayed, tortured, flogged, crucified, and killed, this is what he said in John 15 to his disciples. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Where do I begin how can the God of the universe, the creator, the one who made all these, how can that great, surpassing, holy being, how can Jesus, yes, that's his name, how can Jesus want to be my friend? I don't get that. If I were Jesus, I, want to be, I don't want to be friends with Victor. Jesus is holy. I am defiled. He is the Lord. I'm a worm. He lives in an unapproachable light. He is that righteous. And I deserve hell and damnation. And the Lord Jesus wants to be my friend. I can't put my mind around that. C.S. Lewis says, said about friends, friendship. He defines, and I love his definition, this description, rather. He says, friends are like this. What? You too? Me too. That's what friends are. Okay? What? You love to read Shakespeare? 
I thought I was the only one. You too? Let's be friends. What? You love to motorbike? <gasps> Me too. What kind of bike you got? See, C.S. Lewis said, friends has a commonality. They have an affinity. There's something that binds the two people together because they share that. The reason I'm raising this is, what do I share with the Lord Jesus Christ? He is holy. I'm defiled. He's the creator God. I'm a worm. What common things can we say about which can say, what? You too, Lord Jesus? Me too. See, the friendship he's talking about is nothing but sheer grace. I don't deserve it. I can't even ask for it. It's beyond my imagination. And Jesus says, look, you don't get to choose your friends, right? Right there. Jesus says, you did not choose me. I chose you. Maybe growing up on the playground, right before you play basketball, soccer, any sport, you know how you made up the teams. You remember? Two best players, two most popular players, says, okay, I pick you. Oh, yeah? I pick him. Oh, I pick them. I pick them. And maybe you were left behind. Were you? And how did you feel? And here's Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. I choose you. I choose you, friends. That, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it gets even better. It gets even better when, when in, in the book of Genesis, when God came down and the Bible says he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. You know that expression walking? That means it's an idiom for becoming, having companionship, friendship. The Creator God, the Lord God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit walked, communed, befriended Adam. And that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is the ultimate friend because he says, not only will I choose you, I'm going to do life with you. I'm going to do life together with you. I will never, 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 ever, ever leave you. This is Hebrews chapter 13. I will never, 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 ever leave you. And I will never, never, ever, ever forsake you. And Christ, the ultimate friend, suffered hell, damnation, and alienation, separation from God the Father, so that he may restore our friendship. See, friends, you get it now. When he becomes your ultimate friend, when we conform ourselves to his character completely, then we can become great friends to others, friends trustworthy. And to us, other people will say, I want to be their friend. I want to be your friend. I want to, I want to open up to you. And that's how we create, cultivate healthy friendship. Imagine a world. Imagine your life. If this came true, that people are being edified, blessed, and shaped by your Christ-like character, and they in turn do the same, and same, and same, repeat, repeat, repeat. Imagine a world filled with people who are friends of Jesus. Pray with me. Risen Christ, hallelujah, hallelujah. We submit ourselves under your friendship. Again, Lord Jesus, I can't believe it that you chose me and you want to be my friend. Your grace melts my stubborn heart. Your grace calls me to conform myself to your likeness. Your grace challenges me to become great friends to others around me so that they too may experience your character and your values. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray for our seeker friends. Friends, I'm talking to you, for those of you who have not 
repented before Jesus Christ, who have not said, I am sorry for my wrongdoings, and I believe that you died for my sins, I receive your grace, I'm talking to you now. May the Holy Spirit say, Child, come to Jesus. Submit. Say a prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You died for my sins and you rose from the dead for my salvation and I follow you. Say that prayer. And for the rest of us, may we continually mature in our faith, following Jesus. In the name of risen Lord, we pray in God's people said, Amen. Friends, I thought it was fitting for me to call you friends. Let's respond to the grace of Christ with acts of worship in two ways. Number one, let us give our first fruits and our tithes to the Lord, joyfully, thankfully, and sacrificially. Number two, let's find a church home in person so that we may not just watch and consume the content, but we get to serve using our time, talents, and treasures. Would you do that? Find a church nearby. Now, next week, we will be talking about how to parent a child today. What a daunting task. You might say, well, I'm not married. I don't have children. Hey, listen, listen. When you follow Jesus, you belong in the community. So you get to help other parents raising up their child. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a church to raise a child nowadays. It takes a community. So don't be so selfish. Learn the principles and the practices and, and then help someone who has children or retain it for yourselves. Who knows? Maybe one day you might become a parent. But talk to me first before you do that. Receive God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you both now and forevermore. And God's people said together, Amen, Amen, Amen. I'll see you next week.